Good afternoon. On behalf of Barry, Callum, and Sheena, and their spouses and their children, and obviously Irene here with us, I would like to welcome you all to this uh, Thanksgiving service. We gather here to praise God for a life well lived, but we also gather here to cherish a life and that was experienced by many, and we gather here to honor him in the best way we can. Um, I'm gonna ask you to simply uh, close your eyes as I lead us into prayer. My name is Eder, I am the church pastor here, and I believe many of you have come from the crematorium service where my colleague Gordy Mackay led you, and I heard it was a beautiful, beautiful ceremony. So we, in that spirit of honor and cherishing John's life, we shall continue as we begin this service. Let me just pray. Would you bow down your heads in reverence to God, please? Jesus, let your presence manifest in this place as we gather here to mourn our beloved John. May you bring healing into our hearts. You are the Alpha and Omega in life and in death. Let the things we share about our beloved John bring joy and healing into the hearts of those who are grieving and struggling with the gap that they have been left with. We know it is hard for anyone to fill that gap that's left in a human heart when a loved one is gone. But we know that in these days, months, and years to come, your spirit will be bringing healing and comfort to the family and friends that gather here today to share fond memories of John. We thank you for giving us the chance to spend time with John and get to know him while he was here on earth. Lord, remind us that as we gather here, none of us live to ourselves just as we don't die to ourselves. We are, we are yours whether we are living in this life or whether we have passed into the life beyond. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. Blessed are those who die in the Lord, for they rest from their labor. You give and take away. Blessed be your name, Lord, the creator and sustainer. God, as we mourn for the loss of our loved John, we ask you to cover his family with your wings of love. Give them courage so that they can stand and they can find, Lord, the strength to keep on living. Father, it's being a, such a big blow for the family, but you are their strength, their strong tower. Lord, we know that you love them very much. It's in that spirit, Lord, of love that we come before you and ask that you, Lord, with your spirit, who fill the, the gap left in their hearts. Give them the courage to face each a day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand and we're going to sing two hymns and chosen by John and the family. Would you stand with me, please?
her seat. I'm going to ask, I have the pleasure to ask a personal friend, a dear friend of John, who is going to be coming, Reverend George Lind, is going to be coming and reading a eulogy for us today. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Thank you very much. What an honour it is to speak in tribute of John, my friend of many years, and to share fellowship with you today. I phoned Barry and said there must be hundreds of people queuing up wanting to say something about John. If I send you some notes, would you mind building them in to what you're saying? Back he came. I'll send you my notes, and you can read them for me. <laughs> I might cry. So might I, in fact, because I've known John for a long time. And this is indeed a privilege. What lovely singing and what wonderful hymns you've chosen today. It was I who took a little film clip of the final verse of that great hymn of faith. Here is what Barry wrote, and I'll add a few comments. John Dixon Miko John was born in Dunfermline on the 12th of February 1932, a second son to Maney and Sandy Miko John and younger brother to Jim. Johnny's education began at McLean School in Dunfermline, and he clearly remembered being taught to knit at school and taking the needles and wool stuffed out of sight up his jersey. <laughs> However, there doesn't seem to be too many memories of learning how to read and write, both of which were to become great passions later in life. John was seven years old when the war started in 1939, and he recalled watching the first air raid on Rothsyth Dockyard from a vantage point on a hill overlooking the River Forth. Fortunately, that raid was successfully repelled by fighter aircraft from the Edinburgh Squadron. Another clear memory from the war years was of the night of the Clydebank Blitz, when the family spent the night in the air raid shelter. Johnny's secondary education was at Queen Anne School in Dunfermline, where he attained to the giddy height of school captain. On leaving school, 12 days short of his 15th birthday, Johnny started full-time employment in an ironmonger's shop, but prior to that he had worked as message boy in a grocer's shop, a stationer's and the ironmonger's. He boasted that the only job he was ever fired from was the grocer's when he fell off his message bike on an icy hill and a bottle of whiskey broke. But what he really wanted to be was an apprentice uh, Royal Ar Navy artificer. That's a skilled tradesperson that maintains and repairs the various systems and equipment on board. But his mother wouldn't sign the consent. And so he sat the same exam and became an apprentice engineer in Rothsyth Dockyard instead. And when he finished his apprenticeship, did his two years national service in the Royal Navy as an artificer. He said that of the group who joined with him in 1952, he was the only one prepared to sign on for a regular engagement and was the only one not asked to do so. And so in a huff, I've never seen John in a huff in my life, brackets, in a rare huff, he was demobbed and went back to the dockyard as an engineering draftsman until he could go back to sea as an engineer on the Admiralty support craft sailing out of Greenock. It was on one of his weekends home in Dunfermline that his friends told him of a certain district nurse called Irene Burt and suggested that he should meet her. Eventually they did meet, but it was not all sunshine and roses. Johnny tells how Irene stood him up twice, before finally going on a date with him. He thought she was stuck up. She thought he was a show-off. <laughs> However, we're supposed to believe in miracles in the Christian faith. However, romance did eventually blossom, and Johnny and Irene married in 1956 and started married life down in Sheerness in Kent, where Johnny was an engineer on a deep-sea tug. 
However, the threat of redundancy from the closure of that dockyard steered Johnny into becoming a port missionary with the British Sailor Society in Fishero, Musselburgh, moving on to Glasgow and then to Leith. In 1960, Johnny moved to the Scottish Prison Service as a welfare and aftercare officer, starting in Edinburgh, and then soon after was transferred to Aberdeen. Johnny remained with the Scottish Prison Service for the rest of his career, serving in Polmont, Glenochel, Dumfries, Perth, and finally Cornton Vale in Stirling, from where he retired in 1989. But so much for the CV. What was Johnny Meikle John really like? For a start, Johnny was a family man. Barry writes, if pride is a sin, then Johnny was guilty of being extremely proud of his family. Of his and Irene's three children, Barry, Callum and Sheena. Of their spouses, Maria, Nairn and Liz. Of his grandchildren, Ross, Joanna, Jane and her husband, Michael, Caitlin and Jenna, and of his great-grandchild, Mikey. Sadly, he never got to meet his second great-grandchild, due just three weeks after Johnny died. The family photograph albums are full of pictures of family gatherings, particularly around tables or on picnics, groaning with food. This is a family that loves its grub. Johnny had many interests. He was an avid trout fisherman and delighted in spending time with his sons and grandchildren, fishing from a boat or the bank of a loch. And despite his claim of being slightly colourblind, was a skilled fly dresser, teaching both Barry and Callum how to tie their own flies. He was, with Irene, a keen gardener. When they lived in the hamlet of Blair Logie near Menstrie, It was like being on the set of the BBC series, The Good Life. There were flower beds, vegetable plots, fruit trees and bushes, geese, ducks and hens. And we can't forget the escapologist donkey, but that's another story. I think Barry forgot its name. He's not written it down. It was Don the donkey. And Ray and I remember that deep bray of his when he was trying to escape. I'll add in, he actually came with the title deeds of the house. The vendors would not sell the house to anybody that wasn't going to accept Don the donkey. So Don was stuck with him. And what wonderful parents he had in Johnny and Irene. Now, Johnny was a writer, having a number of pieces published in Christian magazines and periodicals, and was for a time a member of the Scottish Fellowship of Christian Writers. While living in Braco, he joined the local drama group, helping mainly backstage, but his fondest memory of that time was the production of Allo Allo, where he, who had never been to France, was required to adopt an Anglo-French accent. After Johnny retired, he took up watercolour painting, joining a local painting group where he made many dear friends. He concentrated mainly on landscape painting, many of which he gave to charities for fundraising auctions. One of his paintings even hangs on an office wall somewhere in New York. But perhaps what most people will remember Johnny for was that he was a man of faith. Right from his teens, Johnny lived his faith wherever he was, on the tugs, in the pulpit, in the various jails where he worked, and on the campsites of Scotland with the Campers and Caravanners Christian Fellowship. Wherever he and Irene ended up, they would join the local church and become very active in the life and work of that congregation in many diverse ways. It was while they were in Dumfries that Johnny and Irene became involved with Torch Fellowship for the Blind. Johnny was a born raconteur, regaling us all with anecdotes and stories, his retelling of well-known Bible stories in the Fife dialect, stories from his days in the Navy and from his youth in Dunfermline. Sadly, as he grew older, his eyesight started to fail, which curtailed his fishing and his painting, but the stories never stopped. Neither will our memories of Johnny Meeklejohn, family man, mentor and friend. Thank you, Barry, for a brilliant eulogy. 
Barry and Callum and Sheena and Irene, I knew John from the early days of my marriage to Ray. And I've said it often in the Meikle John's company and often in Ray's, when I grow up, I want to be like John Meikle John. I'm still trying to grow up. There'll never be his like. He was a unique friend. That was something of an understatement, Barry. Johnny and Irene became involved with the Torch Trust for the Blind. In Dumfries, Johnny and Irene were Dumfries Torch for the Blind. That is how Ray and I got to know them. And I can tell you now, as Barry has said, he was a man of deep Christian faith and blessed with the most magnanimous spirit. He is one of the greatest men I have ever known, and I am grateful for his friendship. Not only is the family the poorer of his passing, so is his massive circle of friends. A people man, Johnny was at ease in any company, from royalty to renegade. Johnny was comfortable in his own skin. He made the people around him feel comfortable in theirs. At the monthly torch meeting, which he chaired wonderfully well, he would start us off in his own way with great gusto, boisterously singing, Bind us together, Lord. When I ever hear that hymn, I can see John bouncing on his feet and getting everybody worked up singing, Bind us together. Then we go on to roll call. He was very keen that people who were non sighted should know who else was at the meeting. And they could hear and pinpoint the other people that were there. And we go through roll call, and skillfully led by Johnny, we'd all get to know who were there. The Torch Fellowship loved him, and he sure gathered a great mix of characters around him. Doogie Clark, Walter Duncan, Raymond, whose second name we never got to know. He was just Raymond, and what memories he leaves. And Molly Porteous, a patient of Irene's. For Irene would find people in her district nursing role who were in need of that fellowship and get them along. We all needed cars with about 16 front seats because people who are non-sighted needed the front seat. We didn't have enough front seats, but somehow John and Irene inspired a whole gang of volunteers to provide transport and help them along. John was a well-connected man, bound together with Torch Fellowship for the Blind. He was bound together with many others. He even got the famous Fred Lemon to come to Dumfries. Remember the man who wrote Breakout? The man to whom Jesus physically appeared in his prison cell? The angels on each side say, Fred, this is Jesus. Jesus standing in a lounge suit saying, John, Fred, you need my help. He got Fred Lemon to come for the weekend to Dumfries. He was so well connected. Well connected with landed gentry so that we got onto their private estates and saw their lovely flowers. The estate of Beachy Blackett down at our Bigland Gardens. Down there at Beeswing. The outing to Castle Douglas on the loch has a famous place in our memories as Torch Fellowship for the Blind. John was out in the boat with Walter Duncan and Raymond, winding them up, pretending they were fish to be caught, gave them an oar each and told them where to smack the fish in the head and he would catch them. John Michael John had great humour and he had the patience, the patience of a saint. He really did. They'd fill their car and take us off to different outings of Torch, not just Dumfries Torch Fellowship, but if he knew of meetings elsewhere, he would fill the car and invite us to do the same and take the gang off to meet the wider circle of Torch people. We were bound together annually at the Bon Skid weekend near Pit Lochry and have great memories of going there. We were bound together with John Mico John socially, as a prison governor, he was outstanding in his field. Like John and his sons, I too fish. I'm a member of a fishing club. Sadly, we lost our club secretary last year, a prison officer. Before he died, I said, Stuart, were you ever in Dumfries? Oh, yes. I loved that jail. Did you know my friend John Meikle John? No. Did you know John Meikle John? I would love to have worked with that man. Years after he left, the staff are still 
talking about John Meeklejohn, his management style, his people skills, his humor, his warmth, and his ability to bring peace and calm. I would love to have worked with that man. But friend as I was, one of John's great strengths I was to discover was his objectivity. When I went to the Church of Scotland Selection School the first time, you're allowed three cracks at it, I was declined. And I was very sad about that. John said, I'll come and see you. So John came to see me. And he was sad as well. Tell me about your experience and your recollections. Because he was part of the Baptist Church selection process. And they're very similar. So I told him in all honesty what had happened. And John, close friend as he was, surfaced with great objectivity. They were right. I would have turned you down as well. <laughs> and he was right. And he helped me get my head round, if I ever were to go back, how to approach things differently. And he left it to that one conversation, not for Johnny, somebody to coach and nudge me to get me through. He wanted to make sure it was a clear call of God and that I was much more clear in my mind about that call. One of your dad's strengths was his objectivity. He was a great man. But to John and Irene, life just wasn't about torch or work in the prison or out with district nursing. Life was about Saturday night dances. When they heard that Ray and I were learning to dance, they said, oh, well, let's go to some dances. And we were in various hostelries on a Saturday night. The rock hall at Colin was infamous for the wee man with the braces. His trousers are up to here. The braces showed about six inches. Out with the slipperine and round the floor, he'd have a skiting round the dance floor. Ray loved these dances because she got to dance with somebody who could dance, John Meeklejohn. We took them to the Bank of Scotland dance. I was employed by them for many happy years. A man of great principle. When the band began to play Still the Night to the lovely slow waltz, which Irene and I were doing, John said to Ray, I am not dancing to a Christmas carol. We're sitting this one out. A man of principle, a man of strength. Bound together fishing. I went fishing with him just the once, and it was a great night, but we caught nothing. Don't worry, said John, I've always got a plan B. We drove back into the famous Bridge of Allen chip shop. He said, choose your fish supper. And this wonderful range of fish was there. Took them home to Ray and Irene. We caught fish, he said, <laughs> in batter. <laughs> we enjoyed that night, yeah. And he knew who couldn't fish. He was kind to them. Was once an American pastor came to Dumfries for a mission. The Reverend Abre Ritter was going to have a mission. When he heard that John could fish, I'd love to go fishing. So John went to collect him. He was horrified to find him dressed in garish tourist clothes. All that Aubrey Ritter wanted was a photo of him holding a rod. Johnny was forgiving and understanding and had a great day teaching Aubrey Ritter to fish. And how hospitable, bound together, socially with this wonderful family in the front row. Ray and I were at Sheena's Queen's Guide Award when she was a wee girl of 12. We were at John and Irene's 25th wedding anniversary in their wonderful big sitting room in Dumfries. And that family, children as they were, had all produced food. And we were told what Sheena had made and Callum had made and Barry had made and John and Irene. It was a brilliant night. Then came their 40th. Then came their 50th anniversary. And then came Barry and Maria's wedding. We were at them all. One night we went with John and Irene and the Robsons from the Feast Baptist Church to Drumlanrig Castle, bound together socially. John was able to get us invitations if we paid a certain donation. Off we went. Now, the charity patron was Princess Margaret. She was in a side room in between dances while Ray whispered, don't you ask the princess to dance. You've not learned to dance yet. John was called through with Irene because the princess sat there looking through the guest list, the names and their occupations. According to John, and I took it with a pinch of salt, according to John, she said, I believe you run one of my sister's institutions. Tell me about it. 
bound together in Christian fellowship. He was a committee member of Radio Solway's Thought for the Day and an excellent presenter there. Throughout life, there's been gaps in our friendship, but he's always been there. Fairly regularly, the phone would go, John Meikle, John here. We've been praying for you. How are you doing? After a gap of many months, it would happen again, and I would do the same for them because we pray for them and the family too over many years. It was at our 40th anniversary cruise on Loch Lomond that we saw John and Irene failing a bit. We never thought we'd see them get old. They'd been young for life. There they were, elderly and frail, but relaxed and happy among friends, bound together with our friends who soon became theirs. Bind us together, Lord. Well, we were bound in time, and as Christians we are bound in eternity. We will not see his like in this life again. But I look forward to meeting him in that place where there are no partings, no tears, no aging process, no illnesses. May his happy soul rejoice in the joy of his Lord. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. If you could stand with me, we're going to sing a hymn together called The Price is Paid. Would you stand, please?
please have your seat. I'm going to ask to come to the stage our pastor worker, Lynn Cranny. She's being asked by the family to read a poem about John and Irene. Listen with me to these beautiful words written from the heart of one friend to another. And it's called When I Picture John and Irene. When I picture John and Irene, I see sparkling eyes that look deep within. I feel a warmth of welcome that leaves an afterglow even now. When I picture John and Irene, I see little acts of kindness, one to the other, that speaks of shared memories, shared sorrows, shared blessings. When I picture John and Irene, I see breakfast time on the golden anniversary of her conversation. What a joyful morning. When I picture John and Irene, I remember family worship round God's word, the foundation of their marriage and the source of their contentment. When I picture John, I hear his bright cheery by and I know that this parting is not forever. <coughs> Beautiful words. Let us turn now to prayer. Would you join with me? Heavenly Father, today we want to thank you for the life of our dear brother John, whom we loved. We thank you for all the ways in which he became special and precious to each of us who knew him. We thank you for his Christ-like values that he so faithfully lived by, for his sense of what was good, right, and decent, for his warmth and humor and his deep sense of family. We thank you for every life that John enriched and for all that he invested of, of himself into the lives of so many. For his strong faith in Christ by which he lived and in which he died. We thank you for the glorious treasury of memories that are ours to keep, to hold on to and to remember the moments that were deep, special, and personal, the times that rang with laughter and fun, for the ordinary days of discovering each other a little more, when affection and love, trust and respect grew and were deepened. We so thank you for his courage, for a life fulfilled and well lived, and for all that John reflected of his Lord and Saviour's goodness and love. We miss him, we grieve, for grief is the price we pay for love, and for those who loved him the most, the grief is felt so very, very deeply. So we pray for those who John loved most in this world, his family. We pray for his precious wife, Irene, his children, Barry, Callum, and Sheena, their spouses, Maria, Liz, and Nairn, and his adored grandchildren and, grand, and great-grandchildren. Grant them all this day and in the coming days 
your peace, hope, and the sure and certain knowledge that John is safe in the arms of his Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, and this time of parting is not the end. Accept these our prayers in the precious name of Jesus and for his glory. Amen. Thank you, Lynn. I would like to share with you a piece of scripture. Should I say that this is not a message, but some thoughts of my personal experience with John and Irene, and particularly with John in his last days. I got to know John just around two years ago, and he has made a big impression in my life. One of the first sermons I preached in these churches was the power of testimony. And John's life reminds me of that. After all said and done, what we see have little, very, very, has very little value, but the testimony we give lives on. And John was a real testimony of faith and faithfulness in Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 1, and 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 to 11, I will read the whole text because there's a context. Simon and Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus, to those whom through the righteousness of our God and our Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of our God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through this he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, to make every effort, make every effort, effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and self-control perseverance, into perseverance, godliness, into godliness, mutual affection, into mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whatever does not have in them, who does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election, for if, you put, for if you possess these things, you never stumble, and you receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. When I met John, and I was thinking about him, how I met him as a young, as a young pastor and as a new pastor of this church, and going to John and Zarin house for a visit. I was thinking through, and to me in a personal sense, and I could say the, say the same for Gordy, my colleague, who have known John and, and Lean, our pastor worker, and many other members of this church. But in my personal experience with him, John has given me five gifts. The first was a firm handshake. And boy, he knew how to do it. So you knew that he meant it. You were in the presence of someone who is 100% present with you. He gave me a sincere smile. So much so that I say with a sincere heart, I had no idea until Lynn told me weeks later that uh, Brother John could barely see now. It felt like he was looking into my soul during our conversation. His sincerity, his smile, his eyes gazing upon me, and I couldn't dare to look anybody else but to him when he was talking to me. The third gift, he gave me a personal gift, personal to him, and it became precious to me. He went to his room and got an old Bible concordance that he bought when he was 18 years old 
He said, I have used it throughout my preaching life and would like you to have it. And, it's, and then he told me the story of how that was bought. So in many ways, John's voice may no longer be heard, but every time I use that book for sermons, his voice continues to speak on. He gave me communion. When we were having communion together, I realized more and more the power of communion. Here is a young man, barely knows this man, from a different culture, from a different nation, a very different generation. But yet we could be having fellowship. Speaking the same language, the language of faith, the language of love, the language of care for one another. And finally, the fifth gift that John gave me was an eternal lesson. When he became unwell, I remember getting the call and, and I called him, I'll come to you. I was in England, so I'll come and I'll, I will see you right away. And the Lord laid in my heart to actually sit down and read scripture with John. And we read the verses that I just read to you. And we sat there for a, for a little while and we're talking about scripture, the power of scripture. And then I think, and I said, Brother John, what do you think about these verses? I said, Heather, what I feel is this. It's that when Peter was writing this, it's like he was imagining Jesus, his personal friend, right in front of him. G Peter is describing a friend and all that a friend can bring into someone's life. And that's how the discussion went, went on and on and on. Then when I returned to see John as the final lesson. So first of all, the, the eternal lesson is to see Jesus as a friend, not, not only as a God. The final lesson, which is a remarkable one. When John became really unwell, in my last visit with him, when, when I get, got the house, he was asleep and he woke up. And I had a few minutes with him and I honestly thought that perhaps I should go. And I said, John, maybe I'll just leave you to rest. And I was about to get up and he got, he got the big hands of his, <laughs> because he had large hands. <laughs> and I said, no, son, I want to stay for a chat. And I sat down again and, and we began to talk about the church because he was particularly keen to know how the barbecue had gone. And when I told him about the numbers and the people that came, he smiled. And then the last thing I said, John, how are you doing? What's in your mind in these days? I said, son, I'm not praying very much. And I said, what does that mean, John? I said, I feel the presence of God so close that there are no need for words. And at that point, I got so curious. I said, what does that really mean, John? I said, God is a presence. Always conscious, ever alive, and in him all things are possible. This is who God is. And I stand here before you glad to know that John is now is always in the presence of God. Forever conscious, ever alive, being loved and knowing to be loved by God. Thank you. Can we sing a hymn together called In Heavenly Love Abide? Would you stand with me, please?
a seat. Let me just say one final prayer. In honor to our God and memory of John and to bless your life. And I will make a final announcement before we leave this uh, area. Would you please close your eyes and bow down your heads, please. God of life and truth, salvation and hope. With your whole church in heaven and on earth, we bring to you our thanks and we offer to you our praise for all that you have done for John, his family, and the people in this room. You gave Jesus to live and died for us. You showed us your plan for the whole world and proved that your love has no limit. And on that first Easter, when you raised from the dead, you promised that all humanity might share his resurrection life. For the hope of our faith, for the good news of, our, of your kingdom, and for all those whom you have welcomed into your loving presence, we thank you, God. Especially now, we thank you for the life of John Miko John, whom we loved and whom you love. We thank you for all the ways in which John became special and precious to each one of us who knew him. The values, the standards John set himself and lived by for his sense of what was good and right and decent, for his warmth and humor and sense of family, for every life that he enriched and all that he invested himself in, for the faith by which he lived and which he died. We thank you, we thank you Lord, for the glorious treasures that are the memories that are ours to keep, to hold on and to enjoy. These moments were deep, special, and personal. The times they rang with laughter and fun for the ordinary days of discovering each other a little more. With affection and love, trust and respect grew and are now, Lord, are mourned. We thank you for the courage that John has shown, the brave spirit, yet humble heart. Lord, as he now rests in the ultimate rest, your presence. It's my sincere prayer that every person in this room and beyond would remember Brother John now not how he died, but how he lived. May the grace of God and the, and the presence of, the Holy, of his Holy Spirit give you the grace and the comfort that you all need as you move on with life. Not leaving John behind, but carrying him in your hearts. Amen. Irene, Barry, and Callum, and Sheena would like to thank you all for your support and attendance here today. And they invite you to join them for refreshments in the church here right after this service. What we're going to ask you to do is please allow the family to leave first so those who need to go home, you can greet them and say your goodbyes. And for those who are staying, make your way to the left. There will be people directing you there where the teas and coffees are. And then we're going to be sitting at the gym hall where there are some tables and seats for all of us there. Thank you all for coming. Please.